Well, the billionaire Warren Buffett believes shareholders are paying a terrific price to see what chief executives are earning. Shareholder activist Theo Buerta and Sunday Times senior journalist Anne Crotty say more should be disclosed when it comes to executive remuneration. This is Tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, I'll speak to both Anne Crotty and Theo Buerta to find out why we need more disclosure and at what cost. Theo Buerta, nice to have you in studio with me this evening. We'll talk to Anne Crotty as well in Cape Town in just a moment. But give me a sense of it, please, because we're a decade into full disclosure of executive pay. Is it adequate? Um, Bruce, I don't think it's adequate at all. I think that, you know, the issue here is, Bruce, we need to have more information to hold the directors to account. So when they declare a bonus um, to themselves or when the REMCO declares a bonus to the executive directors, shareholders should be able to actually work out how that bonus arrived and therefore they need to have that information available and how do you get that information through the remuneration policy so you'll read the policy then you'll look at the report and from the policy you should be able to um, you know make up your own mind whether that bonus is a fair and reasonable bonus now in um, I attended the Standard Bank and APSA's AGM and I felt that their remuneration policy um, didn't disclose certain pertinent facts in order for me to be satisfied as regards to the bonuses that were paid to these executive directors. Anne Crotty in Cape Town, is the problem that only yourself and Theo Buerta, maybe a handful of small shareholder activists, bother to try to understand the minutiae of how this is all calculated? People get terribly excited about the big numbers, but very few people actually try to work out how it all comes about. Yeah, I think that is a huge part of the problem and I think it's made much bigger by the, the quality and the level of disclosure on, on the subject. Um, you know, it, it's, PwC came out with a report last week on all of the, which dealt with all of the companies listed on the JSC, but it only dealt with their total guaranteed package and left out rather, rather blithely the, the whole issue of the share options that executives are rewarded and that is the hugely generous portion um, of the remuneration packages. But they said they left it out because it would have been misleading to include um, an assumed valuation for share options. I mean, that, that is the easy option and it serves executives very well. Uh, and that's the problem with it. I mean, when you look back at your career, Anne Crotty, you first really became well known as somebody who understood executive pay at the time that you exposed Nedbank's attempt to get itself incentivized through dimension data options. That was probably 12, 13 years ago now. Um, since then, you've been at the forefront of encouraging sh uh, more disclosure on pay. Um, do you think it's been worthwhile as an exercise? I think it's just another case of the law of unintended consequences at work. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of that in executive remuneration. Back, I think, in the 90s when uh, Clinton tried to rein in executive pay, he said there should be a limit, I think, of $1 million on executive pay. And then you had the introduction, in response to that restriction, of share options. And that is where the huge money is now being made. Um, I think there's, there's enormous amounts of information coming out of annual reports, but it's, um, it, it, it's, kind of, it's almost mind-numbing. And it doesn't, I mean, my co-author has suggested, uh, in the latest book, has suggested that what companies need to do is, is make assumptions on what the share, share options that, have, that are allocated each year would be worth if the executive attained all his um, performance objectives. Um, and so, and if he doesn't attain all of them, you know, what would be worth at the, at the midway level? And then, you know, obviously he doesn't get any if, if nothing's attained. And then that gives you figures that you can actually mm. look at and establish some kind of value for share options. Warren Buffett and Crotty suggesting that this is not really worthwhile, that it's costing shareholders an absolute fortune to try to decipher what it is that executives are earning. It has spawned an entire industry of advisors. It, it has been quite a considerable growth industry the industry that advises companies on how to dodge the bullet, as it were. Um, is it worth the cost that companies incur to their shareholders to find out what the bosses actually do earn or as close as damn it? No, I don't think it is so far because of the poor quality of the information that, they've, uh, that, it, that it has generated. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. It's another one of the unintended consequences that this huge... Um, very well paid um, industry has, sp has grown up around executive pay. I would also think that you know, on remuneration committees I would, be, I, I would be pleasantly surprised if more than two or three members of a remuneration committee actually know 
how much they are paying their executives or potentially what they could be paying them. Um, so I think the quality of information is not up to scratch. Um, and I think the shareholders need to say, hang on, stop with the quantity, just give us something that is actually much more valuable in terms of putting a figure on it. Uh, and Crotty, thank you. I mean, here we've got a situation where companies are spending an absolute fortune to tick the box on disclosure. Um, and Warren Buffett says it's not worthwhile. And Crotty agrees. What's your perspective on this? Well, I mean, yes, companies are spending a fortune on ticking boxes. And they're spending a fortune on ticking boxes to adhere to the King Code. But at the end of the day, it's not about ticking the boxes. At the end of the day, it's about um, you know appeasing your shareholders, whether they are major shareholders or, mi or minority shareholders. So at the end of the day, it's about putting the correct message across. And I think they're lacking in terms of um, putting information available so that shareholders can make a logical decision. Do enough shareholders actually care? The only people who really seem to care about executive pay are the trade union movement and a couple of, and a couple of activist shareholders like yourself. Um, do shareholders really care enough about pay for it to be a significant enough issue in South Africa? Well, what you want to see is you want to see your bigger shareholders. You want to see your asset owners and your asset managers actually stepping up to the plate yeah. and holding companies to account. Because, Bruce, once a year you get a, a, a resolution put forward to the shareholders, which is a non-binding resolution on the remuneration policy. And asset owners and asset managers actually need to go th look at that resolution. Because what if, in year one, they vote for the policy and they say, we don't find, we, we have no problem with that. But yet they haven't really looked at the policy. In year two, pops up. The CEO gets an awesome bonus and he gets fantastic options and whatever. How can that asset owner or asset manager then complain if the policy hadn't changed? Yeah. So it's damned if you do, do and damned if you don't. So therefore you're, the likes of the PIC actually need to now drive the process and spend a lot of time and, spend and allocate more resources to this very important um, subject which we're debating today. The, the PIC owns about 13, 14, maybe 15 percent of the total JSE. Is it a significant enough force to drive this change, to drive this interest in directors' pay? Well, let's put it another way. The PIC is the biggest investor mm. on the JSE. And, they're the and ones if it doesn't get it right, well, what happens to the ones that need to drive the process? And, and they can drive the process, and they can drive the process behind closed doors. They don't have Do to they? pitch up. I think there is a lot of um, but asset owners and asset managers. I think the engagement is behind closed doors, um, and I think that's where it stops. Um, but they need to step it up a bit, and if companies do not change in terms of actually giving shareholders proper information, then they need to actually appear at the AGM. And, and Crotty, I mean, AGMs are probably the least attended events on the shareholder calendar. Um, the snacks aren't what they used to be, possibly. Maybe that's why nobody goes anymore. But what one looks at the AGM process, one looks at the backdoor dealing that happens between the asset managers and the companies themselves. Do we need to get the asset managers <coughs> to come out in public and be a lot more publicly out spoken about the positions that they're taking uh, when it comes to dealing with boards of companies? I think, I think they should. I think it'd be much more effective. Uh, but they are terribly nervous about doing that. I have Why? spoken to a number of the institutional managers. I think they've, they've got a relationship with the chief executives. It's, it's, it's actually also a, there's a, there's a conflict of interest. Absolutely. Because they also need to stay on side with the chief executives because they're hoping to get other business from those chief executives. Um, so there is that conflict. Um, and then, you know, it's, uh, some, some of them are very good, I think, and, and aggressive at engaging behind closed doors, but we have to take their word on it, you know. And it's, it's, um, it's just really, uh, um, it, it's it's not comforting. I mean, they say they're engaging, but then the next year we see uh, you know higher, more generous um, executive remuneration awards. The Australians uh, seem so to be getting wonder, yeah. The Australians seem to be getting it right, and more than anybody else. Two votes, and you're out as a board. Two votes against you, and you're out as a board. If uh, if shareholders vote in subsequent years against your pay policy, that is surely something that would go down like a lead balloon in South Africa, which is why we should introduce it. Yes, I, I agree, uh, absolutely. They, I mean, you know, even, even now, I mean, one of the reasons the AGMs are such tame affairs is that there's not even a, a record published of how, how people voted at AGMs. It's just all the resolutions were passed or not passed, you know, so there's no breakdown. Um, I see in the PwC report they said that if, 40, if over 50% of your shareholders have voted or against the remuneration package, PwC advises that you engage with them. Now, I would have thought that if more than 10% vote <laughs> against it, 
you should be engaging mm. with them. But you know who, who really need to come to the party here are the trade unions. They've got this enormous power, which, which they, are, they have abdicated in favor of the institutional shareholders. I mean, it would be very interesting to do an exercise and see where are the f uh, NUMSA funds invested on the JSC and see who's, who's managing them and what, have been their, um, <coughs> what has been their engagement at AGMs and on the issue of, um, share remuner uh, of executive remuneration. I mean, that's the trouble. That, if they came. Yeah. Absolutely, if they came to the party, yeah, no. it would make it considerably more interesting. Would you, would you welcome that, Theo? Yeah, I'd like to see you know, the trustees of these funds, like, which are supposed to be managed by, you know, through NUMSA. And actually see those trustees step up um, because you have this layer of people, investment consultants, and then you have your asset manager who manages the fund. Mm. So the trustees actually need to be more educated and, and need to be more aggressive. Also, you need to um, look at the code for responsible investment. Um, it is in place um, and you know, asset managers and asset owners have to adhere to this code. Five uh, very simple principles. Um, and obviously remuneration issues are something which they need to address. What about the coziness that exists between some asset managers, as Anne Crotty suggests, and the management of companies? Is that something that concerns you too? Absolutely, there is a coziness. So you would say you have uh, listed company X, it's got a pension and provident fund, and um, in this pension and provident fund, they, some of their shares are in that fund and it's managed by Y. And you know, Y and X doesn't want to upset the Apple card because he's managing mm. you know, the listed company's pension and provident fund. So there is a, there is a sense of coziness in terms of this issue. Um, however, having said that, you know, I think things are changing, Bruce, um, albeit slowly. The, the wheels turning, and um, you know, I'm, I tend to be positive in terms of these processes. Well, that's where we're going to leave it. Theo Buerta, thank you very much. Shareholder activist Theo Buerta, and the Business Times reporter Anne Crotty in our Cape Town studio, author of uh, various books on executive pay. Her most recent one is on the shelves at the moment, and it goes in depth into the detail of the underworld, the greasy underbelly of executive pay. Overstating it, perhaps, but certainly shareholders need to care a lot more about what the boss is being paid for delivering sometimes paltry returns. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Till then, good night and goodbye.